Hi, I'm Michael Lasavita, the Director of Communications for Catholic Near East Welfare Association on Difficult Mission, and welcome. This is an exclusive interview with Mary B. Cunningham. Mary wrote for us a very fine piece, I think, in the March 2023 edition of One Magazine, an article entitled Mary, Symbol or Saint. Good afternoon. May I call you Mary or Dr. Cunningham? Which do you prefer? Quite happy to be called Mary. <laughs> <laughs> really grateful to have to have your piece mm -hmm. um, in the magazine and 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 now to be speaking with us. It's um it's really a privilege. Thank you. Not at all. It's a privilege and an honor to be invited, and it's lovely to meet you. There's sort of like a, a flow here. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that I need to ask you the questions or anything like that, because I hate to interrupt a narrative. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea is, is to where did you start from, you know, yeah. and, and why did you want to, to study theology? And then moving into the obvious questions that I think leads finally to um, your, your work. Oh. Um, well, you asked me um, why I chose to study theology and where. So I'll start at the beginning of my studies. Would that be a good idea? Um, <clears throat> I, I had really no idea that I would do this when I was growing up. I grew up as a Quaker in the Society of Friends. Um, my family lived near Philadelphia, so we went to a Quaker meeting, although I was actually baptized as a Episcopalian originally, because my mother shifted to Quakerism when I was about five years old, partly as a result of moving to Philadelphia, where there are so many uh, friends and meetings. Um, so it wasn't until I got to university, I went to Harvard University, that I began to take courses on the history of Christian thought, which fascinated me. Uh, I was particularly interested in some wonderful courses that were taught on early Christian history and medieval Christian thought, Western medieval largely, um, taught by people like Giles Constable and Caroline Bynum and other shining lights who were there at that time. Um, so then I sought out a department where I could pursue this interest and I chose what was not called the Department of Theology, but it was called the Depart the Center for Comparative Religion. And it just so happened they'd started this in the year that I arrived and begun to offer it as um, a degree course for undergraduates. So only about eight of us were admitted to this tiny department. Um, but because it had just started up, it was full of inspirational teachers. We studied a range of things, including systematic theology, history of Christian thought, but also world religions. And we were encouraged to go and visit other churches and other faiths and have a kind of experiential um, introduction to these religions as well as purely academic. So it was a wonderful course. The classes were very small because there were so few of us. Um, and I continu continued to prioritize courses on history of Christian thought and the history of the Christian church. But at the same time, I was doing a minor in classical Greek for no particular reason, except that I wanted to study Greek and got fascinated by that as well. And then I learned that there was a professor of medieval Greek teaching at Harvard, Professor Ihor Shevchenko, a, a Ukrainian originally, um, who was a great Byzantine scholar, particularly a philologist. He studied texts and could teach uh, how to read manuscripts, but also all the literature that came out of the Byzantine period and he encouraged me to come to his seminars where I could both study the history of Christian thought and look at the medieval Greek side of that. And there I met some Orthodox students and scholars um, who invited me to go with them to their churches. That was my introduction to Orthodoxy, really. 
Um, but it did seem to me when I was living in Cambridge in the early 1970s that when I went to a Russian church or a Greek church, they were quite um, ethnic, if I can put it that way. They were largely made up of people of Russian or Greek descent or, of course, Bulgarian or Romanian. Um, but I didn't meet any converts at that time, and it didn't occur to me that I could join that church. So then I came to England to do my graduate studies. Um, I came to the University of Birmingham because there was a center for Byzantine studies there uh, under Professor Anthony Breyer. And when I chose my thesis topic for the PhD, I chose to work on the homilies of St. Andrew of Crete, who's an 8th century preacher and hymnographer, a very important one. He wrote the Great Canon, for example. So everyone's heard of him. And I was editing texts. And I, in about the second year of my PhD, I came to live in Oxford because I needed to consult manuscripts that they had in the Bodleian Library. And it was then, as I was reading the Fathers, the background to Andrew of Crete's thought, they were all Greek patristics uh, and their writings. And there were some great luminaries here, like um, Bishop Callistos Ware, who was also a lecturer and a professor at Pembroke College. And I was able to attend his lectures. I started going to the Orthodox Church in Oxford. And there I met many converts and was drawn in and it just seemed the logical extension of my studies to see this wonderful tradition in action as it were and to experience the liturgies and to hear the hymns and the homilies of Andrew of Crete being sung and read um, and it was kind of a natural progression since I drifted away from Quakerism and really was looking for a more sacramental religion that I asked to be received in 1983. And I was uh, instructed for the catechumenate by Metropolitan Callistos Ware, who uh, at that point was still a priest. Um, and I was received into the church in 1983. So um, that is sort of the history of how I chose to study theology, but how it also led me into um, joining the Orthodox Church myself. And um, from then on, I would say that um, combining my studies and my faith was just a complete natural given to the way I worked. One fed the other. And although in my career, when I got academic jobs after finishing the PhD, um, I was always teaching in what we might call secular universities and theology departments that did not have a confessional approach to the subject. There were variations in that. I mean, the University of Nottingham, where I ended up, had a fairly Christian staff, and they were quite open about their faith with their students. And many of the students came from evangelical Christian backgrounds. So that was a very kind of warm, supportive atmosphere, and it was easy to teach theology in a setting where you knew that many people did believe. But we also had to understand that many people did not believe, but they approached the subject purely for academic and intellectual reasons, and we encouraged that because theology is, uh, it can be very um, challenging intellectually and uh, did, did you find about did you find particularly in in that environment the you know we talk about the the particularly in Great Britain and the United Kingdom about there being but the United States now you know this increase of secularism and the distance the the infamil people's um their lack of understanding or of of vocabulary um that uh, there's a distance there that that idea how did that impact how you taught and how you even write um because one thing that i've noticed over the years is is that 
is that you're you you write very clearly and 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 unlike most orthodox theologians or 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 theologians um eastern catholic as well who tend to use huge dime store words and and etc yours your your work is very clear and and concise and approachable what was the impact was that impacted by by your your experience in teaching well thank you for saying that first of all i'm glad that you find my writing clear i think it probably was i think i we realized as lecturers that we needed to explain everything you can't assume that everyone has read the bible even or yes. that the stories of the old testament and the new testament so you really have to begin by assuming no knowledge but at the same time of course you don't want to spend all your time explaining the basics so yes. it's part of the role of a teacher to tell students when they need to go and do this background reading and learn these basic foundations for what sure. they're going to study. But I think I always try to understand what my audience, where they're coming from and what they need to, to learn by trying to be somewhat interactive with them. And then you quickly pick up on what you really need to explain and what you don't. What was challenging at the University of Nottingham um, was that I taught courses on Eastern Orthodox theology, and that was an area that people had no knowledge of, and they didn't even know why this should be important or why they should study it. It seemed exotic and strange. I would tend to get eight to 10 students in a class. It was hard to attract more but they always got fascinated by it. And I always tried to stress that this, much of what I was teaching is a shared tradition up until the 11th century. You know, we share the same fathers, we share the same saints, um, we share the same history. And Eastern and Western Christendom at the beginning was not so divided. There was a great deal of um, influence from East to West and also West to East. And I think it widened their horizons enormously to be able to teach this subject, which is often neglected in uh, theology departments, unfortunately. Although there are so many Orthodox Christians in the world. Yes, especially now with, with mass migration of people and, and the availability. Yeah. And were, were those studies, but were they interested in, in Byzantine uh, Orthodoxy or Russian or Greek or... Was it just a general sort of an introduction to? Um, the main course that I taught on Eastern Orthodox theology was not historical, particularly. Okay. Okay. I organized it thematically. So we would look at doctrine. We would look at, um, I often had a week looking at icons and the veneration of icons, a week of saints. Those particular subjects, you'd be surprised how little they knew. Um, some of the students, Western Christian students, who might be um, well-versed in Anglican tradition, but kind of had this often a slight worry that there was something kind of idolatrous and superstitious about all this, and that would include the mother of God. So you need to kind of uh, educate people and show them the theological foundations for these beliefs and practices. Also, the very idea that faith is also about action, that there's no real divide between orthodoxy and orthopraxy, that what we do is what we believe, and um, the importance of material creation in our worship. Um, this is a way towards God through material objects that help us to venerate God through icons and through physical objects like crosses and um, that the saints are part of a whole community of Christians who help us in our prayer. All of these things were quite foreign to many of my students. So I didn't ever, I have taught in Orthodox, there aren't any seminaries as such in England but there are um, some 
institutions such as the uh, Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge, where I gave some lectures, where you enter a room of Orthodox Christians, it's a completely different experience to be teaching them. And I always enjoyed that a lot. I'm sure. <laughs> and it's, I did notice the difference between teaching in a confessional space like that. Yes. In my secular university. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, it it seems to me that it's natural that that your interest in Andrew of Crete, his homilies, but particularly his hymns, would naturally bring you into, into the subject of Mary, the mother of God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and who wrote some wonderful homilies on the Mother of God, really among the very best um, on her nativity, on her dormition, um, and on her annunciation as well. And um, I always was fascinated by those works, also by his hymns on those subjects, and wanted to do more work on the Mother of God. It really took off in about 2000 the early 2000s, when a colleague of mine at the University of Birmingham got a big grant specifically to further study on the Byzantine understanding of the Virgin Mary. That was how the grant proposal was framed. And she employed me as a, as a research assistant for three years. And we had various projected outcomes. One of them was a translation of homilies, 8th century homilies on the Mother of God, which came out in my little book called Wider Than Heaven, which was published by St. Saint Vladimir's um, press. And we had also, we organized a conference together and that was published, the proceedings of that conference. And we published various articles, and we had always planned to write a book together. This was Professor Leslie Brubaker and I. Um, but once the grant ended, we both became very busy with our teaching, and somehow the book got postponed. Um, and in the end, because she was so busy, I decided just to write my half of it, because she's an art historian and works on material culture and I was working on the texts. So I brought out my book um, last, two years ago, finally, on um, the mother of God in Byzantium, looking at texts, specifically at homilies, hymns, and hagiography in her honor. And that was published by Cambridge University Press. And it's a more scholarly book, I suppose I would say, than some of the other books I've written, which are yes. more for general audience. For, for our viewers, you know, one of they're not familiar, of course, many of them, many are, with the iconoclastic period and um, that period of time where the veneration of images were strictly forbidden um, in 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 the Byzantine East um, mm -hmm. and and even in the West, there was some reservation about about it. Um, even though it continued, um, but in a mo more modified form and, and less elaborate. And then, of course, in the mid-8th century, you have the triumph of, of, of orthodoxy. Yes. The role of, of, I've heard it described that the understanding of Mary and her role in, as, as God-bearer, mm -hmm. um, and and the incarnation of, of somehow, I hate to use that word, uh, with iconography, with icons, and the development and the understanding of what the icons represent. Could you speak of that relationship between, because there is one, and I can't formulate it quite well as you can, um, and I think it'd be of interest to our, to our, to our viewers and listeners, that role that, that the image of saints and how we venerate saints um, and 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 pro divine providence and Mary's own connection there theologically. I'll Would try. Yes, I'll try. Um, because I mean, the evidence suggests that her veneration 
became much more widespread and much more sophisticated, if I can put it that way, and much more worked out in the course of the eighth and ninth centuries, which, as you say, happens to be the period in which some emperors were trying to impose a ban on image, images or iconoclasm on the Byzantine Empire. So I think the connection is that a lot of the theological argument in the first period of iconoclasm, that is between about 715 and 787, focused on Christ and the iconoclasts were arguing why, how on earth can you portray Christ in an icon when he is God? Um, you're either separating his human nature from his divine nature and just portraying his human nature, or you're committing blasphemy in that you're portraying God in an icon and God is uncontainable. And the iconophiles or the lovers of icons responded by arguing that you know, following on from the Council of Chalcedon, that his human nature is extremely important. He chose to become incarnate. And if we deny that and deny putting him, being able to depict him in an icon or to think of him as a human being, we're denying the incarnation itself. And they also perceived, and I think this must be connected to more and more veneration of Mary in her own right in this period as well. But people were beginning to focus much more on her role in uh, conceiving and giving birth to Christ, that she was the one whom God chose to give Christ his human nature. And all that human nature came from her, biologically speaking. It was her DNA, if you like, um, because there was no father involved. And so she is, in a way, the proof of Christ's incarnation and of the reality of his humanity. And another way of expressing that and making it real for people, I think, was to begin to focus on her human qualities, her motherly aspect, how she was a tender mother of Christ, how much she loved him, how she cradled him in her arms. The art historian Ioli Calavresu has proved that icons only began to depict the more tender mother of God, the Eleusa, as we call it, um, after the period of iconoclasm. So people were meditating and reflecting on her role as mother for the first time, really. And another way they did that was to focus on her reaction to his death on the cross, that According to the evangelist John, she was there with the evangelist John himself and witnessed the crucifixion and experienced the sorrow, the pain that a mother would feel at seeing her son executed in that terrible way. And this shows her humanity, but also it shows his humanity. And these are very real and visceral ways to kind of think about God truly becoming human and that his mother was a real human being and a real mother. Um, and you find this reflected in the icons that began to be painted of both her tenderness as a mother, but also her lament at the cross. And it's all post ninth century after this period of iconoclasm. And the texts back it up as well that you get increasingly passionate, emotional homilies and hymns about the mother of God, which help Christians to reflect on the reality of Christ's incarnation. This isn't just an intellectual concept. He truly became man and he really had a mother who loved him and who followed him and who suffered with him. Does that make sense? as an answer to your question that's, that's it's absolutely beautiful it's absolutely beautiful my my uh my background is in art history and the development of the icon and so i think mary what you've done so beautifully is connected the theology theology of colors mm -hmm. with as an art historian would look at it from from you know if 
the development of something maybe because of what are the influences and 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 I thought that was beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by it. Oh, um, at, at the same time in the West, not at the same time, but a little bit later, you began the development of, there began a development of, of images of Christ on the cross that were much more human in nature, um, that instead of the Christus Rex type of triumphant Christ on the cross that we're familiar with, uh, um, there became a, a much more uh, human and and a, almost a, you know exaggerated, of course, heavily influenced by iconography in in the Paleologi and the late Byzantine period. Um, I, I really really would like to understand or or have our readers maybe where you brought us now um, in understanding Mary. Um, as mother of the church, as mother of Christ, what kind of a role can she play in or does play in helping us to understand? I um not understand, but that that in many ways we're the church is one. That's the name of, the, of our publication. We profess an ecclesiology here that is is that um that unless we are forced to encounter the difference you know, always act as if the church is one. It's sort of like a, our operating principle and practice. And and Mary is a very good example of that as mother church, as mother of the church. How um, do you think she could, how can she continue or more than just continue to be um, a model for unity for Christians, both East and West? Mm. I'd like to start by saying I totally agree with you. I just so strongly believe the church is one. And um, the divisions and the schisms are a tragic part of our history, which we need to overcome and work to heal. And I do think that the mother of God can play a role in that. Um, although there are branches of the Christian church that have a distrust of the veneration of the mother of God. I don't think anyone would deny her importance in the gospel story um, and be able to relate to her in some way. But what the Orthodox and Catholic churches have is this rich tradition that grew over the centuries of reflection on her importance, as we've been saying in the incarnation, her essential role in that, in both giving Christ and proving his humanity and remaining uh, a symbol of that, if you like, a symbol of the incarnation. But I think we can each relate to her as well as a model to follow. Um, she represents for me an example of complete selfless and sacrificial love. She just gave her life to this and to enabling what happened through Christ, um, it couldn't have been easy, you know, it was, it was a sacrifice for her, I think. And we're all called to do that. And, but she's such a loving example of that and has this motherly aspect that makes her someone we can look up to and follow. Um, so I strongly believe she can help in this process of healing. Um, another thing is that we often make a lot of the differences, say, between Catholic and Orthodox understandings of the Mother of God, and people focus on things like the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, and the Orthodox say we reject that, and how could the Pope have published a bull on that subject? But if you look back into the tradition, the fathers from the very beginning were talking about her purity. They use all kinds of adjectives to talk about her virginal purity, her sinlessness, really, is what I'm trying to say, her holiness. Um, from the moment she was conceived, the only difference I can see is that 
the Greek fathers tend to stress that this was a continual process with her, that she continued to be graced by the Holy Spirit and she continued to grow. And some texts go into this in a, in a fascinating detail. Um, I would cite, for example, Gregory Palamas, wonderful homily on the entrance of the Mother of God into the temple in which he talks about her as a hesychast. And she is, during the period she was in the temple, which you may remember, according to the apocryphal text, was between the ages of three and 12, he was learning to lead a life of silence. He actually uses this word silence and just removing herself from worldly thoughts and temptations and preparing herself, but also above all finding God and pursuing a relationship with God that ultimately was a hesychastic one. In other words, she was deified and became unified with God and just focused entirely on God. Um, so there's maybe more nuance in the Orthodox tradition than just saying, well, she was absolved of original sin from the moment she was conceived, and that was that. But there's a richness in the Catholic tradition too, and ultimately I think we're saying the same thing, and we venerate her in the same way. And one final thing I wanted to say was there's something that can be offer a little window of new revelation in the Mother of God. And I think we see that especially in the Catholic Church. For example, in all these stories of apparitions to very humble people like Bernadette of Lourdes, um, which the bishops of the church probably had grave doubts about when they first heard about it. But somehow, the church gets behind those apparitions and believes them that she can appear to the humblest of people in the most unlikely circumstances. And somehow you can break the sort of orderly flow of things and have divinity breaking through, through the mother of God. Um, and that's a great glimmer of hope for me. Um, you know, it occurs in different ways. You have healing icons in the Orthodox tradition but she's somehow at work um, in our church today in ways that are often quite unexpected, but very real, and to which people relate, perhaps because she is a woman, perhaps because she has this motherly aspect. Um, but you always have to stress they're coming closer to Christ and to God through her. She's not an object of uh, worship in herself, but she is... Um, another conduit for us along with the saints and it, yes i i that image the image of of pope francis when he returns um first before he goes on a, any trip pastoral trip he goes to santa maria maggiore or, you know saint mary major and prays in front of what i think is a sixth century icon of mary and entrusts his trip and to her, mm -hmm. um, obviously to, to Christ, but through her. And then upon his safe return, the first place he goes is back to that, back to that papal basilica and kneels in front of that image mm -hmm. and thanks her for, you know, bringing him back. And it's a very important icon to the people of Rome. Yes. Um, and, um, and there he is there she is in all her imperial Byzantine splendor you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the transept of of yeah. Santa Maria Maggiore. It's a beautiful image. Yeah. Um and and definitely symbolizes, yes, the how she continues to play a role um in in our faith. Um it is is it's an ongoing development. And I love that concept that you said, Mary, earlier about how for the Greeks it's more of an ongoing process mm -hmm. um, of um of continual conversion, I suppose. Um which, which is makes her very real as a person, I think. Absolutely. It's it's she's not completely uh, removed from us, but shares really in all things um with us because she's a human person that's, um, right. that's beautifully put 
Well, Mary, thank you so much for your time um, and and for your work uh, oh. and your research and your writing and um, really, really grateful um, that you've taken the time to be with us this afternoon. Well, you're very welcome. And it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for all your kind words as well. Yeah, it's genuine. Thank you.